Hey, Cypher here. I know Hidden Figures was a popular movie, and has received ridiculously high praise from both audiences and critics alike, but I thought it was simply alright. Nothing outstanding or deserving of particular praise, just another mundane Hollywood biopic, only with three characters instead of one. Unfortunately, as with any Hollywood movie like this, it undermines its own narrative by falsifying the story, but I don't really see how that could have been avoided here. These women's stories were not filled with enough drama to make for a particularly engaging story to begin with, so the movie seems like more of fan fiction than anything else. It's like one of those stories where they bring a bunch of characters from different stories into one connected one. Like any of these Once Upon a Time or Grimm shows, just with early NASA employees. Their story in reality was quite separate from one another, as you will see. Dorothy Vaughn was hired into NASA's predecessor organization, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA in 1943. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had issued some executive orders removing discriminatory hiring practices in defense-related industries, so she was hired into a segregated unit called the West Area Computers, specifically to be one of those computers. NACA had been segregated by Woodrow Wilson in 1915, and it remained in 1943. As a side note, why is it always Wilson who's a blight upon our history? Why can't it be some other president? Anyway, segregation continued in NACA until 1958. So Vaughn was one of those early computers. And what you have to understand is at this point in time, computers were people rather than machines. You'd give them a set of instructions to calculate, and they would do the job that electronic computers do today, but they would do it by hand. Because those kinds of computers were barely around at this point in time and incredibly cumbersome. So computer was actually a job title. I've seen some people taking offense to the word computer used to describe people, but it's not derogatory in any way. So to those people, get over it. That's like being upset that you called someone a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. So the segregated computers were administered by a white woman until 1949. Vaughn replaced her, becoming the first black supervisor in NACA since its inception in 1915. The West Computers worked well for years under Vaughn, until in 1958, NACA was disbanded and NASA was founded. With the changeover, NASA officially ended segregation in the workforce and combined the computer pools. Ladies, we've been reassigned. By the early 1960s, human computers were beginning to be phased out because electronic computers were becoming more and more prevalent. It's called an IBM, a mainframe machine. Apparently, it can do our calculations in a fraction of the time. Vaughn became a computer programmer instead, using the language called Fortran, which is a computer language for scientific calculations still used to this day. She retired from NASA in 1971. Katherine Johnson was an amazing mathematician from her earliest years, almost a child prodigy. She was only 18 years old when she received her bachelor's degree. She was even chosen to desegregate a graduate school at West Virginia University, complying with the first round of desegregation rulings from the Supreme Court in 1939. She was hired by NACA in 1953, where she worked under Vaughn as one of the computers. When NASA disbanded the West Area Computers, Johnson went to the Spacecraft Control Branch. Essentially, they were trying to calculate how to fly the space missions. We bring him in too soon, he burns up on re-entry. We bring him in too late, he's pushed out of Earth's gravity. And any changes to mass, weight, speed, time, or a puff of wind would alter the go-no-go. -no -go. And we start our calculations over. She was the one who calculated Alan Shepard's flight in 1961. Office, computer, for every mission that went out at that time. The height, the speed, and so on. It became a geometry problem. And was even asked by John Glenn to verify the electronic computer results for his flight in 1962. It took me a day and a half to compute what the computer had given him. It turned out to be the exact numbers that they had. 
she helped construct, through her on-the-spot calculations, nearly every trajectory of the Mercury and Apollo missions. She was even instrumental in reconfiguring the flight trajectory in the Apollo 13 mishap. She worked for NASA until 1986 in a number of capacities, even co-authoring 26 studies. She was even awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015 for all this. Mary Jackson was hired as a computer by NACA in 1951. In 1953, she took engineering courses from a school that she herself had desegregated, earning an engineering degree by 1958, when she was promoted to being an aerospace engineer just after the NASA changeover. She was the first black female engineer in NASA, though there had been black men and white women before her. Jackson jumped from being a computer calculating wind tunnel experiments to being the one who was actually designing those experiments. She authored several papers and co-authored even more, a lot of which has to do with supersonic flight. She eventually took a demotion in order to become the administrator of NASA's Equal Opportunity Division in the 1980s which handled issues of race, class, or gender between NASA's personnel. After being there for a few years, she retired in 1985. So this movie is kind of weird scholastically. It is the first time I know of in which the namesake of a non-fiction movie was made simultaneously with the movie itself. 2001 A Space Odyssey did it back in 1966. But that's science fiction, not history. The relationship between Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick during the making of that movie, and the resultant differences in tone and plot, are somewhat similar to what happened here though. In both cases, the book came out mere months prior to the release of the movie. It's kind of weird, and I've never heard of this ever being attempted before. Of course, Margot Lee Shetterly, the author of the book, is in a very different position from Arthur C. Clarke both as an author and in genre. With fiction, you can make it up as you go along, but history is not fiction, so the story is already there. Shetterly is acting more as an investigator than somebody just making it up. Also, Arthur C. Clarke was an imminent author in his field by 1966. Shetterly is just getting started as a historian. This was her first work, and she was a journalist beforehand, not a historian. Basically, she became a historian by completing this book, which means the movie rights were sold to this history book by a person who was still becoming a historian. Very awkward indeed. And it shows, not only in the movie, but in the intent of the book as well. The idea behind the title, Hidden Figures, should be pretty obvious. It's meant to point out people in which previous narratives have left out, but still remain important to those narratives. As in, they have been hidden by history. Now saying that these people in which the movie depicts have been hidden by history is an overstatement to say the least. If anything, the thing that has obscured these computers from prominence is the fact that they were a few among many. We don't talk about the numerous engineers and scientists who worked at NASA as being hidden by history for the most part, let alone the computers who worked for them. Calling them hidden is to mistake the nature of their work. Now, Shetterly's book actually focuses on a number of other computers, not just the three in the movie, but the problem remains. It also is not as though there hasn't been previous scholarship on these women. Firstly, two out of the three were well published in their own right. Secondly, all of them have been the subject of numerous works, from oral history projects to the Obama administration's Women's History Forum. There is a manuscript publicly available online which covers this subject and was submitted more than two decades prior to this. Also, NASA has a cultural resources wiki which has been immensely useful in finding both primary and secondary sources on this subject. All of this stuff pre-existed the book. But that is all in tone. The substance of the book's scholarship, as in its veracity, meets what I've come to expect of newly minted historians, and for the purposes of this review, remains unassailable. It is the movie's veracity that is in question, for it seems more like somebody making a fan fiction out of Shutterly's research.
I'm going to keep this short because there's basically nothing correct about this film. That being said, I'll get into why that's understandable later. From the outset of the film, we're shown how little it will come to resemble reality. So the beginning of the movie tells us that this is happening in 1961. The highway in Hampton, Virginia, 1961. And it's all supposed to be progressing from there. Yet we see them immediately going to the West Computer Group, which hadn't existed for three years by that point. We're also treated to the three characters renting a car to work together, which is patently false. They are shown as being all buddy-buddy in this, but in reality, Vaughn was the other two's boss until 1958, when they all went their separate ways. And they were never recorded as doing any of these things together. They obviously knew each other, but as co-workers, not necessarily friends. A great deal of this movie is based on these factual errors. All of the history before 1961, from Vaughn becoming a supervisor in 1949 to desegregation in 1958, is shown as though they happened at the same time years after the fact. But what really bugs me on this squashed chronology is the fact that they make a bunch of big events, like the first dog in orbit, happen in this 1961 time frame. That happened in 1957, so don't even expect to get some good space race history out of this one. Also, as a side thing that really bugs me as soon as I found out about it, in the movie, they showed Jackson's supervisor, this engineer guy who says that he's Jewish and had actually been in one of the concentration camps, and uses that to encourage Jackson to become an engineer. I'm a Negro woman. I'm not going to entertain the impossible. And I'm a Polish Jew whose parents died in a Nazi prison camp. Now I'm standing beneath a spaceship that's going to carry an astronaut to the stars. I think we can say, we are living the impossible. If you were a white male, would you wish to be an engineer? He wasn't even an immigrant. He was born in Massachusetts for Pete's sake. Kristallnacht happened while he was in graduate school in Alabama. I wasn't aware that there were concentration camps in Alabama. He was American through and through. Yes, he was Jewish, but for some reason the movie's producers decided that, well, Jewishness must automatically mean that they've been in a concentration camp. That's kinda screwed up. You shouldn't say that somebody was in a concentration camp when they never were. Don't do that. Now to get off of that, bits and pieces of this thing are combined into Johnson's individual story, while Jackson and Vaughn are hidden by the plot. So for instance, this big thing about Johnson having to run halfway across the Langley campus just to get to a colored bathroom is something that happened, but it was Jackson instead of Johnson. Johnson, in fact, didn't notice that the bathrooms were segregated for two years, and when she was confronted about it, she paid it no heed, continuing to use the white bathrooms for two more years before they were officially desegregated in 1958. In fact, this awkward dating is meant to serve one central plot point that completely loses focus on the other two characters. The climax of the movie comes when Johnson loses her job as a computer to the new electronic computer from IBM. But then, John Glenn demanded a recheck of the numbers, saying, Let's get the girl to check the numbers. But wasn't Vaughn one of the coders of that IBM? So isn't that also somewhat of an insult to her story arc? But the movie just subsumes her story for Johnson's. It's a little hard to trust something you can't look in the eyes. That's right, Colonel. Catherine did manage to calculate a few decimal points further than that hunk of metal. Well, I will take every digit you got. Be sure to thank her for me. Now, this actually happened in 1961, for which the whole movie's plot revolves. But is it enough to make everything else subservient to it? Well, actually, yes. I think so. This may be strange for me to say, but I think that this movie would have been incredibly boring if it were more accurate. Now, I normally advocate accuracy for the sake of making better movies, for the truth is always better than fiction. Plus, you avoid distorting our understanding of the world by telling the truth. But here, the truth doesn't seem filmable. Trying to communicate several different stories happening over the course of decades is not something Hollywood seems particularly capable of. 
Of course, that begs the question of why even bother trying to film this, when there are plenty of other stories to tell that could easily give that same point. But that would mean that Hollywood would have to have a clue about the world it wishes to portray, and we all know how out of touch they are. It would take a truly gifted set of filmmakers to make that vision come to light. And Hidden Figures was a movie made by committee, because good filmmaking is always a risk. The movie was perfectly engineered to take advantage of the current political climate. <laughs> Pretty heady stuff. Yes, it is. Identity politics were already on the rise before the election, so this movie would have done well no matter what, because it plays to those sensibilities. But then, Donald Trump was elected, surprising the entire Hollywood establishment. Instead, identity politics continued to rise in prevalence, but with seemingly more urgency. Into that climate, this movie was released. That is why it was so popular. It told an inspiring story about overcoming racial bigotry from the perspective of those oppressed, at the time the public most wanted it. It plays to people's political proclivities, tugging at everything that the nation most prizes in recent scholarship. Even the fact-checkers were duped into praising it. People were quoting Katherine Johnson as saying that the movie sounded accurate after having seen it. That doesn't mean anything, though. That quote could easily mean quite the opposite of what these fact-checkers were bringing up. And then, they always failed to mention that NASA had been desegregated for three years prior to when this movie is supposed to take place. Here at NASA, we all pay the same color. Now that's not to say that there wasn't some sort of systemic racism having just desegregated. Despite what you may think, I have nothing against y'all. I know. I know you probably believe that. But they're depicting it as being segregated, which is false. So I don't think the film deserves the praise that has been heaped upon it, and certainly not the ridiculously high ratings it has gotten on Rotten Tomatoes. It is an alright movie if you simply want fan fiction, but that's pretty much all it is. You're not going to learn anything out of this, you're not going to actually be shown how people overcame racism, or anything. It's a simple story that holds no meaning after the fact. Or, to put it more simply, the history that this movie wishes to portray is the real hidden figure. <laughs>